As certified financial planners, we've seen firsthand how financial wellness is connected to other areas of wellness in our lives. Join us as we explore the relationship between our physical, emotional, and financial well-being and share the habits and tools we found effective in the pursuit of a balanced, intentional life. I'm Lauren. I'm Donna Grace. This is Life Rebalanced. Today's guest is Veronica Sagastumi. She's an ex-corporate CFO turned content marketing strategist with a passion for helping accounting, bookkeeping, and tax business owners create content to increase their visibility on social media and grow their business online. After a 20-year corporate career as an accounting and finance executive in Silicon Valley and in the San Francisco Bay Area, Veronica faced a personal life event which led her to make the bold decision to trade her corner office in for a home office. In 2011, Veronica left her CFO position to start her own consulting practice to work with startup companies as their business consultant. Fueled by her experience, Veronica skyrocketed her practice to quick success. In 2016, she ventured online to help other accounting, finance, and tax business owners learn how to show up online with a strong content marketing strategy to attract and connect with clients, helping them to show up like the experts they are, make a greater impact, increase their online visibility, and grow their business online is her primary vision and goal. Veronica has built a thriving consulting and coaching business from the comfort of her own home and is excited to share her journey. Well, Veronica, thank you for sharing your story and your journey with the Life Rebalanced family today. Thanks for being here. I'm thrilled and excited to be here. And I know we're going to have a great conversation. We are. So two things stand out to me about you. One is really your story behind your business transition is what I'm honestly most interested in. I love the idea of being in a corporate setting, working really hard is what it sounds like. (laughs) And then taking all of your skills, your network, but also your passion to pivot all of that into something that aligns with your values and the mission you're looking to accomplish. But then also what drove you to that? So can you share with us your story about your journey and how you got where you are today? Absolutely. I don't want to say it was one of my favorite stories to share, but it has a little bit of everything for so many people that it resonates with them and they can relate to, or they recognize where they are in their journey. Because many of us, we start that traditional route. You know, we go to school, it's embedded in us to get that corporate job or to start going after that corner office. The corner office that represents success, financial, title, staff, team, accolades, whatever it is. And I think that for me, that traditional journey started with college, for sure, being one of the first ones on my paternal side of my family to graduate on a scholarship and just did really well for myself. And so started that journey very aggressively here in the Silicon Valley of getting jobs and titles, getting promoted and going after those companies that had the initial public offerings and doing getting stock options early on when I had no idea. I think the naiveness of (laughs) somebody saying to me, well, we're going to go public and we'd like you to be part of the team. And me saying, sounds like fun. (laughs) Not realizing. It sounds exciting, right? It sounds exciting. Interesting. Because when you started talking, I was thinking, oh, you know, you were talking about the corporate life and climbing the ladder. And I was also (laughs) thinking for a lot of people, that's also safety and security of having a structure around you. Mm -hmm. But now you just pivot into being like, well, it's in Silicon Valley and it's startups. Yeah. So that's actually a whole different ballgame. It really is. And I think that early on in my career, because it was just a couple of years out of college that I got introduced into this world of startup companies, aggressive, aggressive growth that I didn't realize I said at the time, but I was getting such a great education for when I would later on for my own business and my clients that I could help. And so whether I wanted to or not, I had a niche in my corporate background. You know, I realized that I loved that fast paced environment. I loved that entrepreneurial spirit that those early founders had. And there was such an energy to it. And you had to make decisions fast, as we used to say, and still say in the Valley, it's like fail fast and fail often, because we learn so many lessons from the failure, not the success. The success. Well, that's like, a gift. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. To be able to learn from your failures and look at them as stepping stones as opposed to failures. Exactly. And so going through all of that and for many years, realizing that's what I loved, I would get recruited. I seldom looked for a job. I would usually get 
recruited. I don't want to say poached because I never left anybody high and dry. I always made a really good smooth transition, which then speaks to later on with my network that I had later then counted on to find my first or next consulting client when I ventured on my own. So not burning bridges is one of those lessons that you take away as well, right? (laughs) Absolutely. And I will fess up that it's not like I didn't burn any bridges. Some bridges (laughs) needed to be burned. Gotcha. (laughs) (laughs) But it was never like, that's just wasn't part of my upbringing with my family or anybody in my circle of friends. We always just did the right thing in terms of realizing that even when you found yourself in a situation that was very difficult or challenging, there were ways to exit gracefully so as not to leave anybody with bad taste in their mouth or that's your reputation ultimately. So I took that very seriously. I think that realizing that comes with maturity too, because that's something that when people are younger and hot headed, like you want to like pivot fast and hard and hot. Mm -hmm. Right. And then as you get older, you realize the world's not that big. (laughs) It really isn't. The world's not that big and the valley's not that big. And guess what? People that work around you, they move to other companies in other states, sometimes other countries. It is a small world. Ultimately, I did find myself in that corner office as a chief operating officer for a financial services company. I stayed with them a lot longer than I had ever stayed with any other company. I loved it. I loved my team, the company, the clients, and the impact that I could make because I merged two things that I love, which is the traditional accounting, very you know numbers driven. The numbers just tell such a great story. If you know your numbers, you know your past, your present, and you can predict your future or at least have a say in it. You have a guide. Yeah. Have a guide. Exactly. A framework. But the other one was my love of software technology. I've always loved that since I was a teenager. And so I was able to have the combination of that and bring it into a financial services company, which is traditionally very structured. And back in those days, you know, it was kind of like, how do we bring it online? So people have an online portal. This is so such a given now, but it didn't used to be like that. So many things that everybody takes for granted now, there were people like myself and my team who had to come up with a way to do it, develop it and test it and test it again. And that was exciting to me. That's where I was. That was my last corporate job as the CEO of that financial services company. And at the time that I was faced with the pivotal moment that you mentioned in my introduction, I was raised by all of my grandparents. I grew up in another country where my maternal grandparents raised me up until the age of 11. And then we moved back to San Francisco where I was born. And I often say, I was born in San Francisco General Hospital, which has been renamed to the Mark Zuckerberg Hospital. And I refuse to (laughs) give that credit. (laughs) (laughs) That is a generational thing. (laughs) It is a generational thing. It's like around here in the Northeast, people give directions by saying like, you turn where the old Almax was. Like it's always giving directions like where the old landmarks were. Exactly. You're at the old San Francisco General. Gotcha. (laughs) I am. And so from that age, I was raised by my paternal grandparents. And so I had one grandmother left at the time that I was in that corner office and she was my life, my light, everything. She just was such an incredible human being. And I was so lucky that I call her my original life coach that I inherited so many or was taught so many of her beautiful traits. And so at the time, My career was just skyrocketing and people think the corner office comes with all these perks, which it does, but it also comes with a tremendous amount of responsibility, stress, overwhelm, sleepless nights, Mm -hmm. weekends, holidays. You're working through all of it because you feel such a high level of responsibility for your team, the company, the clients. And also you want to make sure that you're earning the title or the role that you have been given. Sure. So to me at that time, my my grandmother broke her ankle in something so silly. She was just already in her early nineties, living alone in San Francisco in one of those houses that has a thousand steps to get to the front door. She was so independent and she broke her ankle just getting out of bed. She entangled her foot in the sheets. So all of us were just like, we just couldn't believe that had happened. But at her age, there was so much more risk. All of us rallied. I have a very close-knit family who we all took turns in being part of her care. But she and I have always had a really close bond, always. And so I knew that I could get her to do things that the physical therapist couldn't do after the surgery or that her spirits would be even a little bit better if I was around or more present with the doctor's appointments. But unfortunately, I was constantly in that dilemma of being torn. When I was with her, I was guilt-ridden that I wasn't with my team. 
or that I wasn't available to attend another meeting or a conference or whatever. And when I was with them, with my company, I wasn't with my grandmother. And by the time I drove home, there was nothing left for anybody else in my home, in my home life, let alone myself. You were torn between two things you you cared about and felt dedicated to and responsible Mm -hmm. to. And you want to bring 100% of yourself to both of those situations. And when you feel torn between, you can't bring it to either. Exactly. It's really hard. And like what you're describing is, so I'm correct in that you don't have children. I do not have children. Mm -hmm. But you still are a caregiver. Mm -hmm. You're a a woman, let's just say. As a woman, we find ourselves in this Mm -hmm. position more often than not. And I think that your story is actually really important to share because people are used to hearing it about moms. Mm -hmm. I would say about parents, but really about moms. Absolutely. But you're experiencing the same sort of emotional tie, the same sense of responsibility, and frankly, the same need. Like it's the same need that so many are. And with an aging population, like there's just more, there's more of this need and more of a need for family caregivers. Mm -hmm. Our families need us. Yes. So you find yourself not wanting to, or feeling guilty for not being where you aren't essentially because exactly. Oh, perfect. You're needed and loved and wanted in both of these places. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. how long was this going on for? I tried to sustain it for about a year. Okay. After a year, I was a stressed out person all the time, but also I don't want to say short tempered, but you know, when you don't get any sleep for maybe a couple of days and everything, I do. the (laughs) the agitation, you get agitated easier or you overreact to something that doesn't need to be overreacted because you're running on empty. You're stressed. You're under, your body is literally Mm -hmm. physically stressed. And at that time when everything was just like, I was just, I felt like I was treading water in the deep end of the pool for hours. And I was just exhausted. And at that time I developed this uncontrollable eye twitch. (laughs) Because your body knows, your your body holds your stress. Yeah, It absolutely does. I mean, I can laugh about it now, but it was just like incredibly, it was funny, but my team would be like, they all call me V. V, are you okay? V, your eye. And we're not on video for the podcast, but I would hold my eye sort of like tilted and stretched out a little bit. So to keep it from Mm -hmm. twitching, like it was. Was it like a pulse in your eye? Yes. It was a pulse in your eye. And around that time, I remember just pulling into my driveway at home. It was like another nine, 10 o'clock at night and having that, the breakdown before the breakthrough mm-hmm. of just being like, I, I'm failing. That's the only word Ugh. that I kept thinking about. I'm failing everybody and I can't keep this up. I think something's going to happen to me. And if I, if something happens to me, all I kept thinking about my grandmother won't survive that. Oh. That's a lot. So it was such a guilt. Ooh, I had forgotten about that. (laughs) It's a lot. lot It was a lot to hold. It is. And so I just sat there and just thinking, there's got to be a better way. I can't keep this up. Why can't I find a solution? But through talking to myself in the car, because I didn't want to go in because inside my house was my, my love, Eric, and my little dog, Coco, waiting for me happy as can be, probably music happening or a meal. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so you're you're dying yes. inside right now. Like yeah. your, your body is physically showing stress. Yeah. You're emotionally stressed and you're worried about not being happy mm-hmm. for the people on the other yeah. side of the door. <laughs> so like how long were you physically stressed? Like feel, how, your eye twitch, how long did you experience that before Like, did you realize what it was when it was happening? Did you realize, oh, this is happening because I'm under a lot of stress and I'm not taking care of myself? Or were you just like, oh, one more thing, chalk it up. Okay, that's so funny you say that because initially I was like, one more thing. Seriously, one more thing to think about or to worry about, to manage. And realizing that I wasn't showing up as the best version of myself for anybody. But also, thank goodness my partner, Eric, a few months into, it was maybe two months of having the eye twitch and sat me down and he says, I'm worried about you. I think that- He saw you. He saw me, you know? He saw. Yeah. He says, I'm worried about you. And I'm also worried that you seem to be stressed and angry all the time. And it wasn't anger, but it was definitely short tempered. It was short answers because I had no mm-hmm. time. I I needed to get to the next thing. And that evening when I had the, you know, pulling into the driveway and- just kind of talking to myself about 
you know, there's got to be a better way. And it was almost like talking to myself and really listening. You've done all these things. Why can't you figure something out to do for yourself like you've done for these other companies so that you can have more time or more room or, and I kept thinking that it was maybe the money. Oh, do you not want to give up the corner office? Maybe it was an ego thing. Just really talking to myself about why couldn't I just let go of something? And I said, how are you going to feel? And that was the last little bit. How are you going to feel if something happens to grandma and you were in a meeting because you did not make the decision that you need to make? And it was just, ah, (laughs) so such a hard conversation. It was too much at the time. Yeah. And I mean, reasonably speaking, bless when your grandma's that old, that could easily have happened. Exactly. And that was the self-awareness that I needed. I realized she's in her 90s. She's not going to be around forever. How much time do I really need? If somebody told me today, you have two months with your grandmother, what are you going to do? That is what made me be like, oh, I, I have to resign. I have to leave my job. Yeah. It just sounds like so much was expected of you. Or or I wonder how much was expected of you versus how much were you mm-hmm. placing it on yourself? Oh, yeah. You're pointing to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> pointing to myself. I think it was self-induced. It was, as you mentioned earlier, you know, I don't have kids, but I am the oldest everything. I'm the mm. born. I'm the oldest sister, the oldest cousin. I know the story. Right. You know, so <laughs> there's things that come along with that first in everything. Yeah. And I definitely felt it. And some of it was self-induced. Some of them was... I did it to myself. Nobody expected that much from me. So that's the breakthrough that came about was me going inside into my home and talking to Eric and saying, I think I need to quit my job, but the accountant and responsible person in me wasn't going to be the hothead and quit overnight. (laughs) Right. How to plan it out. What does that look like? What do I need to do? What would I do? And it took another six months. But can I just say that the moment I made the decision of what I was going to do, I could breathe again. I believe you. I should have differently. I was just going to ask, actually, mm-hmm. did you feel like you lost 10 pounds? Yeah. Did you feel like a weight was just lifted? Yeah. Well, it's like you can start to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. I had an experience a few years ago where I had said yes to too many things mm-hmm. and my stuff was not as intense. I just want to say as what you're explaining that you went through. But that being said, mine was not as intense. And once I finally put one thing off my plate, I felt a huge amount of stress relief it was like a tightness in my throat or in my chest and like just worrying about Mm -hmm. getting things done by other people's deadlines and meeting expectations, but also just not wanting to let people down that I'd committed to. And so I can only imagine that if one of those people is my family (laughs) and actually working in a family business, (laughs) I will say that One of those people is always my family. (laughs) So I guess I am in the same boat with you. Mm -hmm. Yes, you are welcome. (laughs) Yeah, like it's an amazing feeling of relief when you can. Yeah, the eye twitch went away. So before you'd actually made the transition, just knowing that you were Mm -hmm. going to make it, you'd made the big decision. You know, that saying the life that you want is on the other side of a difficult conversation. Exactly. Always. You had no idea the difficult conversation was with yourself. (laughs) (laughs) You had to have it with yourself before you could present it to other people. All right. So six months of just like unsustainable schedule, unsustainable commitment, stress, then realizing things need to change and then setting yourself up for your career pivot. Is that where we are kind Mm -hmm. of? Absolutely. So when did you share with your team that you were going to be leaving and what were you doing to get yourself ready? Because now I have to think Uh, that it's almost like you have a side hustle. You've got your job and then, mm -hmm. but you've got to prep something on the side. Meanwhile, you're still caring for your family. So where are you in all this? What does it look like? Exactly. First, I was talking to my family because I didn't tell them what I was going to do because everybody would think I was crazy to give up the corner office, right? The job, the career. But I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was giving it up. I just wanted to transition to look something else. But I spoke to my family to see where it is that I was needed the most, you know, with the caretake with my grandmother, because she was in a facility, but it was sort of like everybody lived in different spots near San Francisco. I wanted to see what my role was going to be. And if I could be more active, I would start backwards, right? By knowing how I was going to show up for my grandmother, where she needed me and where I could help the family out, I could then carve out what does that business or consulting gig side hustle look like in order to give me the flexibility that I need, because my priority was to be there for my grandmother and to help out with my family. And so I started to think about what could I do 
what could I offer in order to generate an income that wasn't such a big hit to put my own home life in financial debt or jeopardy. And so I started to think about, oh, what could I consult in? I've done all these things in my background with the accounting and finance with all these startups. And so I started to put some feelers out there and reach out to people just with a simple email, asking them more about where they were at, what were their company needs, where they were getting stuck in the scenario of if this, then that, hey, if I was to do this, would that be helpful to you? Is that something you'd be interested in? Before I even made an offer, I was already what they call nurture your network, right? I was just reaching out to find out how they were doing. I follow up with what's going on in their business. And then the third one would be a little bit more about what I was thinking about doing. Like your market research. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And my market research was like, hey, if you become available, let us know. We'd be interested to talk about what role you could play in our business as a consultant. Everything was as a consultant. I could not be an employee. One thing for a similar one. And you were looking to gain control, not give it to somebody else. Exactly. We know starting a business is not easy. It is definitely full of risk and it you have to plan it, but it's also going to be time consuming. But I knew that I could do that on a part-time basis so that I could have more flexibility in my day to attend a doctor's appointment, to go have a quick tea or a breakfast with my grandma and then go on and help my clients later. I knew that I could do it. I just did not know what it was going to look like or what role I would play. I had played so many roles in my corporate background that I knew I could fulfill uh, something and I needed to also put my ego in check. Hmm. Because as a consultant, I knew that I wasn't going to be like the top dog, yeah. the chief nothing, I'm the chief, of nothing. <laughs> chief of nothing, you know. <laughs> C-O-N. <laughs> There's a lot of weight that comes with the letters chief financial officer, CFO, chief operating officer. I wasn't going to have those letters anymore. I was just going to have the experience. And so it was up to me to be okay to reconcile that shift in the role in that I knew at some point I was going to have to mourn that person that I was versus who I wanted to become in order for the ultimate goal of being there for my grandmother. I did not tell my How team. How was that? Oh, it was hard. I don't think enough people talk about the transition between a corporate executive. No. And initially I was a consultant. It was later that I started to build my consulting firm, which I still have to this day. We just don't talk about it mm-hmm. when I'm talking about the content creation piece. But it was hard because as a consultant, I was used to giving a recommendation, advice as the chief operating officer and having things just get done. I was used to giving almost like put a request in and got implemented or rolled out. As a consultant, you're advising, you're Mm -hmm. guiding, you're giving all this feedback input and the client ultimately decides whether they're going to take it or leave it. And when they left it, it was like, Oh my gosh. <laughs> was it, it was like gutting. It was gutting. Like, I just did all of this work. Mm-hmm. What do you mean you're not going to? You know it. You, Those are the words. It's like your identities in it, right? Like yeah. you put effort into it. And from their perspective, well, they paid you. That's what you got. But it's exactly. It's like you put a child out there and nobody's taking care of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's absolutely, you feel like that. And it was the first time that I felt like that gutted feeling. I had put a lot of effort into it and just gave such great input and feedback and guidance. And I knew that it was going to be such a great thing for them. And they put it on hold and they didn't go, they didn't move forward with it. And it was like wanting to fire them as a client, wanting to have that conversation. Are you kidding? What are you doing? I just I just had to bring it back. So a really big part of being successful after you left your job was to figure out your new identity. Mm-hmm. And I run into this with retirement planning clients all the time, oh. figuring out what it's like to go from being the upper, you're near the top of your career when you're mm-hmm. retiring, or maybe you're you're not the top guy anymore, but you've got the wisdom and the respect of everybody, right? Mm-hmm. And you go from that position and being productive to being a consumer without a title. Yes. <laughs> Very often grandma or grandpa, but it's... <laughs> It's really different. Yeah. And I think that what you're talking about for people who are transitioning careers to something so different, that's such a pivot, mm-hmm. is really worth exploring and worth mm-hmm. like paying some time to. Yeah. So you can be happy. Like you, yeah. you don't want to be unhappy if you're changing careers to be happy, right? Mm-hmm. You were looking for balance and happiness. Exactly. And that's just it. I think that if you're going to be doing this and transitioning to start your own business or be a freelancer, consultant, whatever it is, just know that it will come. 
it's going to hit you. And you have to allow yourself the grace, the space, the patience to go through it, to feel the feeling. No, you didn't make a mistake. Doubt will creep in. But just know that you will work past it because just keep people will say, oh, think about your why. Or for me, it was think about the who. Mm. Who was I actually? Your who was your why? Yeah, my who was my why. I love that. I'm going to borrow that or steal it. (laughs) All yours. (laughs) But it's one of those things where you do mourn. You have to like let that person go. It doesn't mean that it takes away your value. It's just a different identity. And that chapter closes, but another one opens and it takes time for the new one to take its place for you to feel value and to feel that confidence that comes from being a business owner where you do provide a great service, where people do value what you have to say. And sometimes they're not going to, but that's okay. How long did it take for you to start to recognize and feel that? And how long is that also relative to how long it really took your business to get going and find its footing? So I also want to take a step back and say that you asked me about when did I tell my team? Yeah. And I didn't tell my team for a long time because we were so close. We still are close. We haven't worked together as a team in a little bit over 10 years. Mm -hmm. But we still see each other. Uh We text, we FaceTime, we keep in touch because we just go through so much. And we've also been part of each other's lives personally throughout the years. I didn't tell them for a month before I left. Okay. I told them that I was going to be resigning. I didn't want to tell them while I was thinking about it because I knew that they could talk me out of it. They could sway you. Absolutely. And I needed to tell them once everything was in play because then I couldn't go back. There was no like rolling back or there's a saying like burn the boats. Well, I didn't burn the boat, but you know, I was close to it. (laughs) (laughs) No, you you were on the boat leaving. You needed to make sure you were strapped in. Exactly. couldn't jump ship. I love that. Yes, exactly. And it was a hard conversation. There were tears and there was a lot of emotions, but they also had seen me through my journey. A few of them had also lost a parent within, you know, the last few years of us being together. So they knew where I was coming from. I got their blessing and they helped me to make that transition. And before I left, I already had that first client. And then I had the second one shortly thereafter, because once I left, I was very clear with the clients that I got were people that were already in my network. Mm -hmm. And if you were in my network, you already knew that my number one was my grandmother. And so it wasn't a hard conversation for me to have with them as to why I was leaving, because everybody was like, you're leaving? Well, I knew that was going to happen. So I preempted that question by letting them know why I was starting to go in on my own. The story behind your change. Absolutely. They wanted some big drama. No, there wasn't any drama yeah. with the company. It was a personal decision based on, I didn't want to have regrets. I didn't want to choose my career or my job over spending time with my grandmother or helping out my family and feeling good about the quality of time that I was going to spend with her as opposed to just the opposite, the other. So this was something that you did not decide to take a leave of absence. You decided to actually pivot and start a new career. So it's it was more than just having mm-hmm. time because a lot of people will take a leave of absence for a while to you know get through mm-hmm. a family issue or a health issue or whatever it may be. Did you mm-hmm. see it as more than just about your grandmother or am I like thinking too deeply here? No, initially it was my grandmother. But when Eric said to me, I'm worried about you, I started to realize that it was also some really, really unhealthy habits that I had developed of working way too long, too much. The stress level always being high. There was never any downtime for that. And realizing that if maybe that my grandmother needing me or me wanting to be with her more was just the almost like a reason for me to make a move so that I could get to mm-hmm. get to that side of like, I can't keep this pace up anymore. I've done so much. I've had a good run for it. There's got to be a better quality of life for me. Yeah. And maybe I was feeling like that would be too selfish to do. Like who quits their corner office job? You needed I, another reason. <laughs> exactly. No. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I, I get it. So You are now in another iteration of your business, right? So Mm -hmm. I know you have your consulting firm, which sounds like it was very successful, but you've also found new ways to help clients within the same niche, correct? Yes. The content marketing. So Mm -hmm. how did your business expand or how did you decide to create this new arm of it? Part of it was seeing how my own firm evolved from me being a one person consultant to getting so many clients and having so much work that I needed to make a choice. 
for me, I started to realize, oh, I have this network of associates that I could actually outsource some of the work to and ultimately started to expand my consulting firm for the accounting side. It just, and my clients are still in my niche, you know, it's the startup companies Mm -hmm. that we help out with their accounting and CFO and just all the business decisions that go into early stage. But I also had a lot of colleagues. I started to do social media. I started to realize, oh, I can do things online. My clients don't all have to be local. I saw a business coach at a conference once. She had a very similar background to mine. And I saw how she was coaching other people nationally or helping clients nationally because she was using the online technology and using social media as a way to show up online. I knew nothing of social media. Shame on me. I didn't see it as an opportunity. My LinkedIn profile was... It was what the kids did. I mean, let's be honest. Facebook, you know, yeah. If we're looking back, because this is around like 2015, 2016, is that what we're talking about? Absolutely. Yeah. Industry has changed so fast. The way marketing has worked has changed so much in the last Mm -hmm. even just five years. It really, really has. So... Yeah. It's like in when you talk about how many years ago, it doesn't seem that long ago, but it may as well have been like a lifetime no. ago in terms of the way marketing works and technology is. Exactly. So the good news is you were ahead of the curve when we all went into COVID. <laughs> I was. Oh my goodness. COVID, what a horrific season in our in our lifetime. But at the same time, it's like there was such an opportunity there yeah. in my field of accounting in tax preparers and bookkeepers. It's very traditional to have an office in-person practice or kind of like more networking, you know, at a chamber of commerce event or a workshop. So I wasn't doing any of that anymore. For years, I had been using Zoom or Google Hangouts or Skype to have meetings. I had clients, I've had clients in Boston, Chicago, Arizona, Pennsylvania, Canada, and I'm here in Northern California in my office. And so I was already using so many of these tools for my own practice that I then was able to say to some of my colleagues in the accounting and tax preparation industry, saying, you guys, you don't have to see all these clients in person. You know, you could host. And at first there was such resistance. Such resistance. Or I would say such resistance, right? I mean, it, it was just like, I don't need it. Nope. No. Why would I need that? It seems like such a waste of time. I mean, I could just... You a, preaching to the choir yeah. here in my industry, <laughs> people thought like you cannot not meet with your clients in person and say, well, when it gets to the point where they can't, but they still need your services and they still need to hear from you, people can adapt. We have to give people credit, give people a chance. They can adapt. Mm-hmm. And when forced to, we'll, we'll rise to the occasion. So you must have been a great resource to the people and your clients and other people in their industry, like when they're going through a stressful time to help them pivot and adapt to reach the people they need to reach. Absolutely. March 16th, right? We're coming up on that anniversary. March 16th, we all got sent home. I was already home, but I mean, like everybody was like sent home. And I think in our previous conversation you and I had, I mentioned that I got busy just creating these Loom videos. Loom is a free app I used the paid one now, just to be fair, but (laughs) to be honest there, but the free one where I just got busy creating all these videos for people to let them know how to set up at home, the equipment that they needed, how to set up the equipment, giving them links to budget-friendly equipment so that they were not going to be scared for it or about it. And it was coming from someone that they knew and I could just Mm -hmm. really show them my setup and walk them through it, even how to keep in touch with their employees to make sure that it was going to be okay, how to reach out to their clients. I mean, I created so many Loom videos over three days that I almost lost my voice. But one Loom video I could share with a lot of people. Right. And what that did is it gave them a little bit of confidence of, okay, first, second, third. And then we gave them about a week or two, never charging for my services, never saying, hey, hire me and I'll show you how to do it. I just sent everything out there. And they allow them to then have a space or a person to then say, where do I get this? Where do I get that? And the more they asked, I would just create resources and share it with everybody because I figured just like we know, right? If one person's asking for that, other people are asking. Yeah. How incredibly valuable. That was actually one of my favorite, well, I mean, probably my only favorite thing, but about that time at the beginning of COVID, people who had resources Mm -hmm. were sharing Mm -hmm. and just positioning themselves Mm -hmm. like you did as a valuable resource. And Mm -hmm. my gosh, you must have helped so many people. Like (laughs) I hope I did. And then I also, in some cases, the resistance was still there about their practice shutting down. I said, it doesn't have to be, you could do this and this. And I introduced them to just little things at a time, especially for, I think about a couple of 
the traditional tax preparers who had had their practice for 35 years and in person. And I'm like, baby steps here. So you could do it. Let's test it. Of course, now this year, everybody's sending out their engagement letters a docu sign this and here's your portal. And it's so much more comfortable with being on video, whether it's Zoom or Skype, offering the complimentary sessions. A year ago, they didn't even know how what to use. So that resistance started to come down just one step at a time and also letting them know, hey, I've got this video or I've got this resource. Here's you can find it. And them asking, how are you doing all this? It's the social media, the content creation, the strategy behind it. And me saying to them, it's an educational thing of saying, they don't know what content creation means in this traditional industry that I've been part of. It is more about, hey, how can you help? What's the message? What's a story? What's a case study? How did you, how to, mm -hmm. all these different things that they could show up with. But initially, it was so awesome to see the resistance slowly, just the wall came down the acceptance came in, their excitement came back and they saw, oh my gosh, I have a new way of doing business that I would have never had yeah. if we hadn't done this going through this pandemic. And what I hear from most people at this point, like specifically those who had extremely traditional businesses that were not on technology platforms, is that this really just creates new opportunity going forward. It doesn't mean you can't go back to your old way of doing business, you can do it just more efficiently. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be really neat to see going forward. I agree. Do you feel like, as I'm just listening to you talk about all that and watching your face as you said it all, like <laughs> it's really just aligns with your mission of sharing your talent, mm -hmm. but helping these businesses grow and helping them get their message out there to people. So mm -hmm. that's great. And I will say on the consulting side of those clients, mm -hmm. there were still a few that required me that wanted me or my team to be on site once in a while yeah. or do this or the other. But now with the pandemic and saying, well, I can't see you, here's how we're going to do it. They now feel like they have more access to me than ever because they get a link to a scheduling calendar. They get the Zoom you know, notification. They are know when we're going to meet. We don't have to coordinate on this travel time. There's less friction. There's just less There's friction. There's less friction. Yeah, exactly. So I've converted quite a few people. <laughs> <laughs> I was a convert too through this time. I had been trying to do it and this propelled us forward in a lot of ways. So mm -hmm. I love hearing that. So Lauren and I, whenever we have a guest on the show, we like to hit on a few questions and I'm really interested to see what your answers are because I feel like so much of your story was about rebalancing things to find the right balance for you at the right time. What is the area of your life that you would say is your real focus right now? It doesn't mean to the exclusion of others. It's just the priority. What is the priority area right now? The priority is the developing of workflows. Okay. So that I can then hire and train more people. And in order for me to scale the business, mm -hmm. I need to delegate. And part of the delegation comes in the training or having the time to train people, but also taking the time to hire the right person and making sure that there's something there. And workflows for me is what worked in my corporate career. It has worked in my past consulting life. But as we are, we've been growing on the consulting side, as well as the content creation you need to systematize things and that comes through workflows and thinking through the process and documenting. And I'm big on the video. Thing, That's so. the key, the <laughs> documenting part, yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. That's actually something that I've been working on over the last year too. Last year was very much on like improving efficiencies for scale and capacity. So yeah, going through workflows, building out workflows where we didn't have them Yes. or just documenting the ones that we already have. It's amazing like how staff has workflows, but I'm like, well, where is it? How do I find it? Mm -hmm. And it's a process. It's painful at times. Yeah. <laughs> well, I will pray for you. I wish you luck. Thank you. <laughs> likewise, regard. likewise. Yeah. So if that area is your focus at the moment, is there any area that you're giving yourself grace on or, <laughs> you know, as you don't prioritize at the moment, what would that be? Oh, I, again, I think you and I talked about this when we had another conversation earlier on, but it was like, it's the exercising. Now, during this pandemic, the whole, it was just so hard to, the routine fell. It's the routine. Yeah. There was no more routine. You had to come up with new ways. And yeah, walking our dog once or twice a day is not the exercise that I need or have had or 
I need right. more. But thank goodness you at least have yeah. that to keep Yeah, moving. exactly. At least that. But I would say, you know, like we're still eating really well. We've always cooked. We've always taken care of that. But the exercise not being there, I'm four foot 11. So an extra five, seven pounds, which they are on me right now. It's a lot. It's a lot. Five to seven pounds is like almost new clothes. It is. I'm going to tell you, I, I went to the doctors and I've gained a little bit of weight and I was waiting for that external motivation. I'm very <laughs> externally motivated. I have learned. So I was waiting for that external motivation. It did not come. She did not care. I was like, why are we not making a big deal about this weight that I gained? And she looked at me and she said, yeah, Donna Grace, you and everybody else. Yeah. So I'm going to put this out there for you. Yeah. She said to me, this pandemic is slowly coming to an end. The weather is getting nicer. Mind you, you're Northern California. So mm-hmm. I don't know how cool it is where you are, mm-hmm. but it's cold. It's, it's cold where I am. It's getting warmer. You're going to lose it when life gets a little bit more normal. Just give it a little bit of time. So I'm going to pass along that to you. I accept it. That <laughs> I receive it. <laughs> Thank you. But you're absolutely right. Nobody can beat us up like we beat ourselves up. Right. That is the area where I need to give myself some grace that I didn't gain 50 pounds. But even if I did, you know, it's like, okay, these are really extreme circumstances we've been going through and trying to adapt to. Ad- everything. Ad- adapt ad- every everything. part of your life You're to right. it. Yeah. Adapt to everything. It's a lot at once. And I think that we just expect our, like, I definitely expected myself to just be able to. Mm-hmm. I was like, you can do this. You can adapt to anything. Commit. Just commit to a routine. You can do this. It wasn't so easy. We're getting there though. Yeah. We're, we're on the right track. I agree. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, I agree. So in thinking about your building out efficiencies so you can hire and your workflows, is there anything that you can think of like a routine or a habit that you're working on with the team that you have that you think is really important or integral to your success at this point? I do have two. One of them I like to share often because it is it is just ingrained in me from since I was a kid, but it was setting my intention with gratitude. And every morning, you know, I just really have that it's not like a, a prayer, but it's like literally and physically listing out the things that I'm grateful for that day in that moment. And the list is not always the same. Sure, you have your big things, you know, I'm grateful, you know, for my health and my family, but it's about being grateful for the little things. And that came about, as I said, I grew up in another country and with my grandparents. So that's just embedded in me from them. But Eric and I traveled to Africa three years ago. It was a three-week vacation with family members. There was 13 of us in the tour. Oh, wow. And we got that to- That sounds amazing. It was amazing. And while the safaris were just incredible, I fell in love with the people. I could not get enough of just being with the tribes or the people at the banana plantation or the tour guides or the drivers or just the local. We took buses. We took taxis. We really wanted to embrace- the culture and getting, we had a great, um, I don't want to say translator. Like immersion. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's what it was. An immersion. It's a good immersion experience. Exactly. And just seeing the most, in some, you know, we went to the slums, we went to the farmer's market, people have nothing and yet they share everything. And to see what a big part of their lives is to just get fresh water or we went to a tribe and there was, you know, the men and the women separate. So all the females in my tour thing, we were mm-hmm. all with them and the men were on the other side and they all asked us, what did we do? And we had in our group, a lawyer, a doctor, a old nurse. I mean, we had everybody and most of them retired. Eric and I were the youngest ones. <laughs> <laughs> I would have loved to be on that oh. trip. I love being with people uh, yeah. like 20 years older it was than me. I amazing. love it. Amazing. And then they came to me and I said, I own my own business. And it was just like this roar of from the women of like you would have thought that I had invented, you know, I don't know what. But and it was because they saw me as everybody in my group was not Hispanic. They were Caucasian. Mm-hmm. They saw me as somebody who had color skin like them. They saw me as somebody that they Mm -hmm. could really connect with and relate to. And as somebody that I'm starting my own business too. So they all started coming up to me and showing me their jewelry that they made or their pottery or their clothing and their Afghans. I'm almost getting emotional because it is just such an incredible experience to see that these women were already striving to do more for themselves and more for their family and their kids. And 
I it has just stayed with us. Eric and I came back, changed people for the fact that we are grateful for running water, clean water. We live in a beautiful home. We have friends, we have family, we have our health and just the things that are not, never did we say money in the bank or a nice car. It was just the little things. And mm -hmm. I still keep in touch with quite a few people that I met in Africa. And they always say, when are you sending for me? Oh, <laughs> you had a real life changing experience. You had no idea. We really did with you, my you partner. You had no idea. That no. And while we were... It was also like what no. you meant to them. Like you you meant something. You, mm -hmm. you were hope and inspiration for them. That's so much. It was a lot to take in. I know it was a lot because then also the people in my group were like, they also got it. They were just amazing people. And we, I had little kids, little boys or little girls take me by the hand and lead me and they're taking me. And so the translator would say, where are you taking her? And they're like, we're taking her to show and tell our mother. Oh my gosh. <laughs> because I spoke English and I was from America. Look what we found. <laughs> Look what we found. Look what we could be. Wow. Like she did it. We can do it too. And it was just, again, I was so not prepared for something like that. And it changed me. It changed Eric and I together. Well, if anyone in your group ever questioned whether or not representation matters. Yes. That was like living, breathing yeah. embodiment of like yeah. inspiration through representation. Yeah. And so that gratitude prayer in the morning since then, it got elevated. And it also now includes my partner, Eric, who is a scientist and he's not a religious person, but he definitely is a very grateful person. And our gratitude routine is very embedded together. Oh, that's really beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that story. I don't even know where that came from. I, I, I wasn't planning on sharing that. I actually had a very practical <laughs> tip or thing, but I think, I think that's important. someone needs to hear it. And now you've given them the opportunity to hear it. Thank you. You put it out in the world because someone needs to hear it. Think of it that way. Will do. <laughs> I wanted to ask, I mean, you've asked me this, all these questions and I feel like there is a question that I had... I thought of when we were talking about the last time. Okay. Because I just enjoyed our conversation so much. And I thought, oh, let me see if I can. As did I. <laughs> <laughs> so my question to you would be who, or, you know, was there a person in your childhood who made such a big impact on you and your life that you think about as an adult or how they impacted you? This is so easy for me and is also so relevant given your story and your, what you've shared with all of us today. But my maternal grandmother and I were mm -hmm. so incredibly close and she died really young. She died when she was just 69. But she was someone who I think about her every day. So when you're sharing your story about if I, if I knew I only had two months to be with someone, what would I want to have done? And she got sick and passed away within a short period of time. And she was never sick. Like when I was younger, she was never sick, like rarely. And she she lived like half a mile away from us when I was really little so I could walk to her house kind of thing. Like she, we were very, very close. I had special day with grandma once a week. And now I see my own mother like carrying that tradition on with my children. My daughter and her will go shopping. Mm -hmm. It's so small, but so special, you know? Mm -hmm. But she got sick in February and then passed away in August. So it was a very short time frame. Oh, like she yes. went from being a healthy, active person to passing away. And I, the last time I saw her, I didn't realize when I was going to see her why we were there. I was a teenager and I, I was like so like shaken by it. The way you got emotional telling a story, like I can feel my throat tighten when I talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know, like when I look at people, I think of her and what I, and I know my mom feels this way too, that she missed so much with her. And like, she doesn't regret any any time that she spent taking care of her family, but I know she regrets that she didn't have more time to be with her mom. So mm -hmm. yeah, thinking about my grandmother, someone who just her, I feel like her spirit is with me and, and my, my paternal grandmother too. She's an amazing, special, strong woman in completely different ways. They're, they're two different people, but both so like beautiful and giving. But I, and when I think about her, what I think about is how like the relationships that we have and the small things that we do, that aren't about money and that aren't grandiose, but are just about being a person that other people know they can go to. So like, I knew that I could go to my grandmother, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. How did we get into this like, psychology <laughs> session here? But it's like therapy session, but like, I knew she was someone that no matter what kind of little jerk I was being, she, it was okay to go to her. And she wouldn't tell me that I wasn't being a jerk when I was, but she, but I knew she loved mm -hmm. me anyways. 
And like all of the small things that I have with her, like all of the things like that are so sensory, like with the cooking and, and food and I, she is so with me. She's just so with me. So while she wasn't someone who was highly educated, she was not someone who had a big career. My gosh, she didn't even drive. She didn't drive oh, as neither. an adult. She had been in a <laughs> really, she'd been in a car accident and was just petrified of it after that. So my amazing grandfather <laughs> would drive us wherever we went or we would take public transportation. So there was nothing grandiose about our relationship, but it was just close and mm-hmm. tight and special and deep. And I don't know. So I just think about wanting to be that mm-hmm. to someone else at some point. Like I feel influenced by that, by wanting to be someone that makes someone feel safe and seen. Like I felt seen and mm-hmm. listened to and cared for. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's what you thought you were going to get out of me in that oh answer. Oh my God, <laughs> that's such a beautiful story. And you're right. I'm so happy that not only that you shared it with me, but you shared it with your listeners because it just gives another insight into who you are and and what makes up but with your core, at the core, who you are, who has shaped you and influenced you. Thank oh, you thank so you. much. What a great, you know, what a thing to have Thanks in common. Thanks for giving you know? me the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> like, that was a nice opportunity. Like, yeah. I don't know how I ever would have like worked my grandmother into this. So yeah. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share. So going back into my, <laughs> my business mode, this is really nice. Veronica, if um, you know, I really I appreciate you sharing your story, your business story and your personal story. And just like I love this is what Lauren and I are so focused on the idea that you can't be all things to all people, do all things at once. Everything can be important, but you have to prioritize and finding the right balance at the right yes. time, right? Every whatever you choose right now doesn't mm-hmm. always have to be front and center, but you need to put it there when it's mm-hmm. due. And like your story so exemplifies that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm glad to have the opportunity to share it. So if our listeners want to follow you, I mean, you're you're everywhere, right? But where do you hang out most in terms of social media? LinkedIn. Yeah, LinkedIn is my number one. And it's because of the clients that I serve. You know, it's on both sides. My clients for my accounting services, they're on LinkedIn. And my yeah. colleagues, my clients for the content creation, they're on LinkedIn. Uh, that's my primary. And it's Veronica L. Sagastumi? L. Sagastumi. Mm-hmm. Very good. I had to sneak in that L because there's another Veronica Sagastumi out there. And you know what? Her content is not my content. <laughs> it is not the same. Okay. <laughs> okay. For business year, it's veronicasagastumi.com. And that'll be in the show notes. So if anyone wants to find you, they can go find you there. Yeah. Come say hello. I'm telling you, if you do say hi to Veronica, you'll be happy you did. I've had two <laughs> conversations I've had with you have been an absolute delight. I appreciate your time so much and for sharing your story. Thank you. Be well. 